Hi, you all right? It's Brexit day. Um, we're all quite excited. Um, so yeah, so I'm going to uh, speak a little bit about the things I'm interested in at the moment and kind of lead into the project. I've got an exhibition here with Stripe, which is the finite state Fantasia that you can see down at the front. Um, I've kind of got really into this question, what's it doing, which is something I probably hear three or four times a day. And you probably say about three or four times a day, what's it doing? And so really, it's a very fascinating question because in, in those three words, certainly in English, you do two things. You admit your ignorance of a system or a machine or an object or a computer or a, a train timetable or whatever it is. But you also assume that it somehow has agency and power and intentionality, right? That it somehow has control over what's happening to it. When I was very young, uh, when I used to complain that the computer that I just played video games on wasn't working, my dad would say uh, that the computer can only do what it's told. It can't actually make up its own mind to not work. So I'm really interested in this idea of how we use human terminologies and kind of start to sort of anthropomorphize technology in a way in order to explain away the way it's working or not working. The video in the background, incidentally, is um, from last year's DARPA challenge, where they, they try and get different labs around the world to build robots to go and perform basic tasks like opening doors and standing up for 10 minutes. Um, so whereas like, there's one version, I, Claire's talk was fascinating because a lot of the way she's thinking about music is how I think about vision and space and stuff. But I'm, I'm kind of more on the side that actually we're a long way from robots that can actually interact with the physical universe in an, in an able way. Um, but more on that as we go on. Um, so the reason for, for this, this, uh, this confusion about what a technology is, and I mean a technology is in a system of techniques, and a, a, a logos of techniques, um, is largely because technologies are becoming so complicated. Both of these objects produce sound, music. Um, if you, uh, most people in this room, if you were to spend a few hours with the gramophone, you could probably figure out how it was making sound, right? It's a mechanical process. You can, you can draw the connections of the causal parts of the system to figure out how an acoustic noise is being made. There's moving parts, there's kinetic energy being transferred, um, there's a record that's being played and then amplified. Whereas on the left, with the now very dated iPhone, uh, iPod actually, I think, um, it's almost impossible to know how sound comes out of that thing. I don't think, there are very few people, I think, in the world who would be able to spend any time with an iPod and figure out how sound is coming out of it. And that's partly because Apple have spent a lot of time uh, proprietarily protecting the way an iPod works. They don't want you to know how it works because that's where they make their money. But also because of the miniaturization and the complexity involved in it. I mean, that said, the one on the left can play 15,000, 30,000, I don't know, songs, whereas the one on the uh, right can play about four or five. Um, this, of course, alludes to Bruno Latour's famous idea of the black box, right, which is pretty well established. We don't have to question this. This idea that as technology gets more complex, it becomes more opaque. It's harder to read and understand the processes. Um, if you think about Google, you go to google.com, you type in cats, and cats appear. We don't really need to know how that worked or why that worked, and we can't really know how or why that worked. We can kind of theorize. Um, but for instance, you go back 30 years, and if you wanted to get cats, you would go to the library, you would go up to the person at the desk and say, I would like to look at pictures of cats. They would direct you to the books with the cats. You would open the book of the cats, and you would say, oh, cats. And that's a much more readable, causally connected technology and process. They're both technologies. But the, the interesting thing that's happening now, and where my fascination comes in, and where my, a lot of my practice and research is, is what happens when the black box is networked, when the black box isn't just something that's in front of you and illegible, but is in front of dozens, hundreds, maybe even thousands of other agents who are all connecting to it. The black box is having input given to it from new types of sensors and sensors, as well as giving information out to uh, advertisers, surveillance systems, uh, parents, I don't know. Um, I was alarmed recently to discover that there was a survey done of the amount of parents who wanted to spy on their kids without them knowing on it. And it was like 60 odd percent of American parents said they would gladly spy on their kids' internet use if they could hide it, which was really alarming. But, um, but what happens when it's connected? What happens when the black box is, is illegible, not just in front of you, but illegible across a network? And what does that mean and how does that change uh, uh, what we understand of a machine and what it does and what it can do? 
the average uh, smartphone now has 19 sensors. Um, if you think about this happy guy here, the phone in front of him where he's got his ears and his eyes and uh, some sort of haptic sensors and taste and smell, the iPhone is picking up, or the smartphone is picking up things like humidity, uh, ma magnetic orientation. Uh, it can detect ultrasound. Most phones can now detect ultrasound. And interestingly, the ultrasound microphone is usually always on. They can uh, see light form, uh, see outside the electromagnetic spectrum that we can see outside. And they're building a massively accurate version of reality. Not a partial version of reality, but one that is super, super accurate. And they're sharing that and comparing it all the time as a way to kind of model behaviors in this constructed hyperreal universe. Um, and this suspicion of these somewhat animistic devices that somehow have their own power in the world leads us into an interesting problem with how we think about these types of objects and how we classify them. Um, this is a very underformed theory, so I have to apologize because I'm kind of still working through it a bit. But essentially, we have the, the things around us, the tools and objects around us that we know uh, are inanimate. And those could be things like a pair of scissors. You know that a pair of scissors can cut things. You know that it can cut you by accident. But you also know if you put them down somewhere, they're not going to get up and decide to cut something of their own volition. They require human input and interaction. The kind of range of opportunities, um, the sort of task envelope, as, as um, Stellock referred to it, is well known to us. And then on the other side, we have things, uh, other subjective beings in the universe that we interact with. And that can be humans, cats. Um, I don't know, do people interact with other things than humans and cats? I don't think so, <laughs> just humans and cats. So, and those things have their own intentionality. We know that other people may do things that surprise us or shock us. They may do things we find horrifying, like vote to leave the European Union. And we may end up having to deal with that decision and sort of cry ourselves to sleep for a week or something. But we know that and we accept that as part of our relationship. I'm pretty sure due to the various social contracts in place that I'm not going to be murdered today, right? But again, it's not beyond the range of possibilities. But in the middle, it's getting closer to being possible, I feel, actually. Um, in the middle, we have this thing of like not nothingness. Objects that present themselves as inanimate tools, physical objects that inhabit the world and are directly under human control, but are also networked and connected and exist in different places and can be updated at random and driven to do things that was perhaps outside of the early limits and opportunities of those types of things. And that leads to confusion, difficulty. Um, this is a video of some guys testing the automatic stopping on their autonomous vehicle. Uh, pretty predictable what was going to happen there. Um, so, so this was, uh, uh, I think, two, uh, three years ago now. Um, and they were told that this uh, Volvo smart car had um, automatic stopping in it, could detect pedestrians and then stop and wouldn't hit them. The, the, the problem is that that's completely illegible. You know, we can't ask the car and check, are you actually really going to stop? If the software tells us it's going to stop, or sorry, if the manufacturers tell us the software will make it stop, we'll tend to believe it because we don't really know how to read it any other way. We don't have a way of communicating directly with a car or a social contract with the car. Um, interestingly, Volvo released a statement after this video went viral saying that um, pedestrian detection was optional. Come on, guys. <laughs> um, so we face this thing which I call the cats with iPads problem. I'm the only person in the world to call this the cats with iPads problem. Um, we, so these cats are trying to catch mice that they're seeing on a screen. They don't fundamentally understand that the mice aren't real and don't exist beyond the screen. They don't have what science fiction authors call the reading protocols, the understanding of the media and the content and how the two things relate. For them, there is no reason why the mice should not leave the side of the iPad and they should be able to catch them. And we're in a similar situation. Things as presented can be very different to things as are real. And what really fascinates me is this difference between how we talk about and tell stories about what machines are and how they work, their thinking, their feeling, their sensing, um, and how they actually work. 
which is through a completely different cognitive system, as Claire was talking about. It's like a radically different way of understanding the built universe, one that we actually are uh, incapable of comprehending because of our limited sensorium. This is um, from uh, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration's report on the first autonomous car crash with a Tesla, which was in May last year, May 22nd in, uh, I can't remember where exactly. Um, and basically what happened is that this Tesla, it starts in the top left there, is going down the highway. A trailer truck turns across in front of it. The Tesla fails to slow down or stop and hits the trailer. The female driver was instantly killed, um, and you can see the Tesla spinning off. Now, there are 48,000 road deaths a year in the US, but this one obviously attracted a lot of attention because it was the first time a car that was fully in autopilot mode uh, killed a human passenger. Um, and there was lots of questioning and so on and so forth. And uh, Tesla released a statement on their blog saying that, um, and there's only one phrase from it that particularly stands out to me, which is that the autopilot system failed to distinguish between the white of the tractor trailer and the sky, which I just find to be such a poetic phrase. This is a machine that cannot tell the difference between the sky and a tractor trailer. Those to it are the same things, inherently part of the same classification projects. It's a beautiful idea, and it obviously results in the death of someone, but it highlights to us this cognitive gap. And when I was putting together this project, that was the thing that really kicked me off. It's like, how do you show people an intelligence, or a cognitive system, certainly, that doesn't understand the difference between a, a trailer and the sky? Um, Mobileye, who are the Israeli software company who originally made the Tesla software, um, released this video shortly before the crash, actually, which shows um, the, the video is called What a Tesla Sees. But this genre of kind of grainy footage with some after effects over it is not what machines see. That is in no way what machines see. We as humans see this and attach meaning to it. We can see cars and people and buildings and streets. We relate to our own experience of driving or walking or being in urban environments. And then over the top is a kind of comforting layer of machine aesthetic that tells us that somehow it is able to see the world in the same way that we do. It's entirely untrue. A machine just sees discrete data points and makes decisions based on preset configurations. It can't actually assign a value to any of the things we're seeing. Machines sense they don't see. Um, Edsker Dijkstra, who uh, was, I think he's still alive, Dutch computer scientist based in Eindhoven at TU Delft, um, tried, came up with one of the most brilliant phrases that surmises this problem of like making the cognitive leap to a machine. Um, he said, the question of whether computers can think is about as relevant as the question of whether submarines can swim. It's brilliant, and it sums up that problem. Yet, yeah, submarines can move through water, but we would never say they swim. They use propulsion, diesel or nuclear propulsion. Computers can produce results that appear to be processed, but they don't think. They can cognate, but they have no embodied or experiential sense of the universe or their own existence, yet, anyway. So in order for us to understand the increasingly uh, uh, prevalent and um, autonomous machine world, a world that is increasingly having action in ours, we need to learn to relate to machines on their own terms. Um, to kind of find a better point of empathy between us and machines. Stop making them do all the effort to talk to us and maybe go a bit the other way. Cat videos are an easy way to anyone's heart and really good at explaining tech things. Um, what I like about this is the cat has about as much of an understanding of what the Roomba is and what it does as we do. Like, it's a thing that is apparently a small box that moves around of its own power and performs a function. For the cat, this is a nice little um, throne for which to ride in its shark costume, chasing the ducks. Um, for us, it's a, it's a cleaning device, but also it's an incredible sensory organ. So the Roomba has uh, two infrared sensors that it uses to detect distance. It also has um, an edge sensor, so it knows if it's going over the edge of something, it can look down and prevent that from happening. It has a physical bump sensor that means when it hits uh, something it knows to stop and turn around and move. Um, one of the early problems of spatially mapping for machines is that the approach was generally... Con because of the way that humans work, when we walk into a space... Stop looking at the cat. This is serious. 
When we walk into a space, we immediately model the space. We live in what a kind of consensual hallucination. The first thing you do is in about a tenth of a second, your ears can pick up whether it's a big or a small space, and your eyes then model it, and then we move through it. Um, early computer science said that that's how machines should do it as well, but then it was realized that if the model changes because people move through the space, or the space is reconfigured, the machine doesn't know how to deal with it. So most um, spatial mapping for machines now works like a Roomba, where it's constantly making it up and guessing. Which led me to the finite state Fantasia, which is the installation here. Um, in the finite state Fantasia, an invisible machine is simulated in the box in the space that's there, 4.3 by 4.3 by 2.9 meters. And the machine moves around mapping the space. Every time it hits a wall, it leaves a point. Um, and over time, it creates more and more points and a more and more reliable sense of how big the space is, where the limits of it are, where the walls are. But the trick is that the machine is invisible, and all, the only thing you can see is its infrared sensors. So you can kind of position it based on the X and Y coordinates it's blasting out of the walls. And the only thing you can hear is its ultrasonic sensors, this kind of infuriating high-pitched whine that I've learned to hate. That is its noise as it's kind of moving around trying to figure out what the space is. The problem is it can also detect you. So when you walk into the machine space, if you happen to invade its world, it doesn't know how to reconcile the messy, changing human physical universe, or alien physical universe as well, I suppose, with its model, with its simple, constrained model. And so as a result, you end up with a kind of distorted pattern growing over the walls as more and more people walk through it. Um, the point of this project was to highlight this difference. Um, I think this is the second time it's been exhibited, and every time people have said, I don't get it. And it's a kind of a dick move to say, well, that's the point. But kind of, that is the point. You're inside another thing's cognition. You're in a totally alien landscape, something that's completely alien and strange to you. And I think, kind of backing up what Claire said, I think we need to learn to accept that. We need to stop trying to model the world after us and understand that the, the shape of the universe is changing, that these machines have a greater sensory power than us and are beginning to reshape our world for us. And we need to find ways of reconciling our messy meatbag human nature with that. Thank you very much. <laughs>